if I am. Yeah, that was a whole lot of waterworks back then. Praise the Lord. Still cry now. I tell people now, I normally don't cry unless I'm in church. That's just the way it is. Amen? That's a good thing. Amen. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. All right. Let's go ahead and pray in, everybody. Once uh, we're, we're settled, we'll get into the word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you now for, uh, for your word. Speak to us, Lord. Make it clear, make it plain. I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that the people of God would hear, that the people of God would be changed, that the people of God would be challenged and set free for your glory. Lord, we're excited and we thank you for your word today. And we know, have faith and confidence that we will indeed be blessed. We thank you, Lord, now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I actually have pushed my laptop to the side unless I need it, and we're going to work from the tablet from, for now at least. Um, Y'all, uh, sometimes... You know, and I know this, this happens, especially with, you know, the preachers, ministers, and that kind of thing. Uh, you just get, you get this concept in your mind, um, in your heart. And uh, it gets in there, and it just starts to stir and, and to work you. And I've had this concept for the last uh, several weeks now. And the concept is this. How many people want to be better? How many people? How many people want to be better? I can remember saying uh, in my, in my mid-30s probably, I've been working for a while, you know, and, and in my, my job job for probably about 10 years or so. And I, I still felt like I was struggling, you know? I be, how many people know it takes a while of work to get on top, you know? <laughs> That adulting thing is for real. It, it takes a while. And so I had been working and working and working, and I can remember just saying to the Lord, I don't know about you, but this is what I said to the Lord. Lord, I just look forward to the day and the time when I'm normal. I, I want to be normal, at least my version of what I thought normal was at that point in my life. And, and for me, normal was, Lord, I look forward to the day when I get my check and I pay my bills and there's still some check left. I look forward to a time where out of what's left out of that check, I might be able to save a little bit here and there and and be able to take my family on a vacation. I, I look forward to a time where, uh, to be honest with you, before that next check came, I wasn't trying to figure out what I was going to do until that next check came. You know, I can remember, though, and I was working hard, you know, um, but I can remember those times. And so essentially, what I was praying was, Lord, I believe you for better. I want better. So that's why I asked you how many people want better. You hope for better, right? But the thing that the Lord has been impressing upon me lately is, Steve, it's good to want better. But do you want better enough to change? It's good to want to be better. But do you want to invest what it takes to get to better? I submit to you that it is, that it is possible to desire greatly 
the godly verse version of better without committing to the godly process of change. And y'all know what we do when we want better? We can sit back and say, well, I want better. That makes me a good person. I want godly stuff. That makes me a good person. And if we're not careful, brothers and sisters, we can get to a point where essentially we're waiting for our Holy Ghost lottery ticket to be punched. And that is, we're thinking about something fondly, excitedly, while in actuality doing very little to make it come to pass. We're basically waiting on God, right? But how many times is God waiting on us? Right? I heard something recently that changed my life. You know, I'm listening to uh, uh, some preachers I love to listen to. And one of them said, he was talking about delayed gratification. And he said, it is possible to be patient yet miss delayed gratification because patience by itself isn't enough. If we're patiently waiting on delayed gratification, we could just be sitting down with our legs crossed waiting for God to move while God is waiting on us to move. And so what's missing out of that equation is what we might want to call mission or purpose. So that while I am patiently waiting, I'm also submitted to the purpose for which or of which God has for me, so that even while I'm waiting, I'm still getting good God stuff done. Does that make sense? The title of our message today is Spiraling Up, capital U, capital P, to God. Spiraling Up to God. And the subtitle of it, and some of the folks that know me, and maybe we've talked from time to time, you may have heard me say this. The subtitle to this is Better and Better and Better. Is there anybody that needs better and better and better in their life? One better won't do. And the, the, you know, the, 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 the gist of this is that when better gets moving, better don't stop. Right? Isn't that good? That when you get to a point where better is self-perpetuating, right? Isn't that good? It's possible. But how does it happen? And maybe when does it happen? It happens when we begin our spiral up to God. Our focus scriptures for the day, and there's actually two of them. The first one is from the book of Proverbs, and it's Proverbs 15, verse 24. And I'm very excited, y'all, about this scripture because it is one of the scriptures that early on in in my walk with the Lord, he stopped me during Bible reading time and said, Let me teach you something. And he actually taught me about this one scripture. Sometimes in the Bible, God says a lot by way of a little. And this is one of those times. So let's read it. It says, the way of life is above. In my version, it says, the way of life 
winds upward. And by winds, think winds or spirals upward for the wise, that he may depart from hell beneath. And basically, my version, the New King James says, that he may turn away from hell below. The way of the wise spirals upward, that he may turn away from hell below. The second scripture is from Colossians 1, verse 9 through 12. And let's read that. This is Paul speaking, and he says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthen with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. This first sermon that I want to deliver today is on the first portion. We're going to focus basically on that, mostly on that scripture in Proverbs today, but there's a part two that's coming later. We've talked about this a little earlier, and we'll, we'll get to that one maybe in a few weeks or so, and that's where we'll deal with the, the verse in Col the scripture in Colossians. So let's just, by way of introduction here, Let's go, to, um, let's go to the book of Mark, chapter 10, and we're going to start in verse 17 because I want to kind of back our way, so to speak, take our time working to our, our focus scripture because there's some lessons to learn in, this, in this, this, this passage of scripture. This is what a lot of us are familiar with is the story of the rich young ruler. And Jesus, and what Je how Jesus dealt with him. So let's read this. It says, And when he was gone forth into the way, he being Jesus, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I might may or may inherit eternal life? Before you, you turn there, doesn't that look good? Back up one second, y'all. Doesn't that look good? Right? He came running. To Jesus. He kneeled down before him to ask him a clarifying question. Doesn't that sound good? Right? It sounds real good. Okay, let's keep going. Verse 18. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandment, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not That was a trick. Was that really it, y'all? Oh, it does that thing back there. But you get the sense of what Jesus is saying. He just repeated the scripture. He repeated, he repeated um, various laws and rules that were in the Old Testament, right? Oh, okay, it's there. Not steal. Oh, there it is. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master... All these have I observed from my youth. All right? Very good. Sounds good, right? Uh huh. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these I have observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. He, he loved him. Have y'all ever had the Lord love you with some loving feedback? Uh, I was on my way up to the mountains one time, and I think I was listening to some Fred Hammond. I was, I was just pressing over the initial uh, hills to get into uh, the mountains up there near Boone, 
And um, out of nowhere, the Lord said to me, Steve, you, you, you're a good father, aren't you? you? You do all sorts of things for your family and your kids, and you sacrifice your time and your money and all of those things. You, you, you just do, you, you do a, lot of, a lot of good things for them, don't you? And I'm kind of like smiling on the inside to myself, you know, well, yeah, I guess I do. And then he said, unless the Tar Heels are on TV. Unless the Redskins, the names were the Redskins back then. Unless the Redskins are playing. Yeah, you all great and wonderful. Until your sports time comes up. And then all of a sudden, you don't want to be bothered. You don't want to do anything else except sit in front of a TV somewhere and watch your game. Yeah, Steve, you're real good. Oh, man. But, y'all, he was loving on me. He was loving me. I didn't want to hear it, but I needed to hear it. And that day, I started what now is my wife, she knows that I'm a sports guy. She knows that I'm a Tar Heel. She knows that I love the Washington football team. Bless the Lord. I say that proudly. Amen. Win, loss, draw, I'm in. But what she doesn't have to deal with is me being immobilized by a sporting event. If I'm able to watch a game that's on, I'll watch it. And if for some reason I'm not able to watch that game, I go on about my business. Now, if I'm fully being honest with you, I have at ESPN the app. I have the NFL Game Pass. Okay, okay, I can go back later and look at whatever I want. I can. But back in the day, I needed to sit in front of that TV. I needed to see the kickoff, and I needed to see the end when that clock read 00, zero colon zero, 00. And that's the way it was. I'm no longer like that anymore. And it started because God loved on me. See? He changed me just by giving me some loving criticism. Jesus says, it says here, Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, <laughs> One thing thou lackest. Go thy way. Sell whatsoever thou hast, and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross, and follow me. Oh, man. Let's go to the next verse. And he was sad at that saying, and went away let me stop there. That word sad right there is an interesting translation of the Greek. Uh, the, the word also could be specifically grieved itself, okay? It's the same word that described Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was realizing what was about to happen prior to dying on the cross. And it's that there was this reality in front of me, and it's been made plain and clear what the requirements are. And I'm not liking it at all. Thanks be to God that Jesus said yes to the requirement. Amen? But y'all, this young man right here walked away Sad and grieving. 
for he had great possession. I could hear it, that young man in his head while Jesus was listing off all those things saying, but what's the profit in that? What's the profit in that? And then when Jesus said, store up riches in heaven, but what about now? This young man, y'all, has been about now. Not later so much, now. And everything that he had heard, every indicator that he had experienced up until that moment told him that he was good to go. When he walked up to Jesus, he walked up questioning, but he also walked up confident. But yet he walked away sad and grieving because that which he thought he was working so hard for really isn't the main thing at all. You know, we talked about, y'all remember a few weeks, or I guess it was a few months ago, I preached a message and we talked a lot about stuff. You remember that? He had a lot of stuff. What he didn't realize was how overrated the stuff was. And we talked about that. His value and even his identity itself was intermingled in with all that he had, all that he achieved, all that he had become. And Jesus said, give it all away. Pick up your cross and follow me. That's tough love, amen? I had a, a couple of young ladies. I, I was visiting one. Um, her, her boyfriend at the time had gotten into some legal issues, and uh, he, he, had, he, had, he got arrested and went back to jail. And uh, so I was there. I wanted to check on her. She had little kids. And uh, when I got there, uh, her boyfriend's cousin was there. So they're sitting there. They both had small children at the time. And we were talking about various things. And the young lady was very, very frustrated. And she uh, eventually, towards the end of, of my time there, she, she asked a very profound question. She said, uh, Elder Taylor, why are these men like this? And I looked at her, and I started shaking my head, and I said, you don't want me to answer that. And then both her and the cousin said, no, we do. We want you to tell us. Why are they like this? I said, you don't want me to tell you that. And they said, no, we do want you to tell, tell us what it is. And I said, you want me to tell you why these guys act the way they act and, and you deal with all the stuff that you deal with. And they said, yes. And I said, it's because of you. And they both together in unison sat up and said, what do you mean? And I said, well, being a guy and understanding some things about guys, and we're not all the same, okay? But let me break it down for you in its simplest form, the way some guys are. I said, some guys are going to do the minimum amount required to get you. And if you allow that minimum amount required to work for you, and you invite them into your house, you invite them to your table, you invite them into your bedroom, you invite them into every other area of your life without no high standards, they're going to take you up on it. They were hot. But I had to love on them. And they asked me. I tried to get out of it. But they pressed me. 
And I had to tell them. I want to believe that at some point since that time, and it's been years ago, that exchange blessed them. But I'm not sure. I haven't seen that young lady anymore. But y'all, here's where I'm going with this stuff, is how many people know that the most powerful prayer in the world is not Lord change them? What is it? Lord change me. It's so easy to blame others for the problem, right? That's what those young ladies did, right? Why are they like this? Because you allow them to be. Not Lord change them. Lord change me. So where are we going with this? Pop quiz, is it better to look like a thing or be a thing? To be a thing. If that's so, why do we in our society today spend so much time looking like a thing? Social media is blown up, right? How many, peop uh, how many people are on social media platforms? Raise your hand. Facebook, I, I, what, uh, uh, Instagram, what's the other, uh, Twitter, TikTok, Snapchat, and I'm not up, up on everything, but what's up with the flexing? What's the flexing? The flexing. Showing off. When I flex, am I a thing or am I looking like a thing? Looking like a thing. Am I anywhere close to a thing? And so that's what people do, right? It seems cool, right? How many people know it's expensive? It costs a lot to look like what I'm not. What about when I'm almost broke, but I have enough to buy the BMW? but then I'm struggling to pay for the BMW. Early in my life, I, uh, I had a really nice car. It went really, really fast. It was really, really exciting to drive. But I realized at some point that once I paid for that car, I didn't have a lot more money left. I couldn't go to Outback. I had to hang out at Burger King. I couldn't go to the beach. I had to drive my car fast locally. Bro, McKinley, that's all I could do. <laughs> I couldn't afford to go have fun. I had to have fun in my car. <laughs> so I would get in the car and hit it, and the turbo would come on. And we just be doing this the whole time. And I'd waste gas and come back home. That was it. No beach. But I did zero to 60 in a fairly impressive amount of time. Somebody say change to get better. Change to get better. Change to get better. Change to get better. So let's get to our, our, our topic here in, in Scripture. What is it about, you know, we're talking here about upward spiral, spiraling up, right? Spiraling up. Why does that work? What's, what's the con? If you look on, and do this when you get home, okay? Get on Google and just put in the phrase, spiraling upward to God. There's this much stuff out there. I never knew it. I've been dealing with this scripture for decades, and I never researched this until recently. I was very happy to find it, everybody. Very happy. There's a lot of information on spiraling up to God, but let's talk a little bit about what it speaks to. Spirals express the cyclical nature of our maturation process and, it, and its related development. I'm reminded, just saying that, 
with uh, some time for the preachers, teachers in here, uh, uh, maybe Sunday school teachers, that kind of thing. Have you, ever had, have you ever had an exciting moment with the Lord where you're studying the word and you get like this awesome concept or something like that? And in your glee, you say, Lord, I got it. I found this. And the Lord says, that's really good, Steve. Now start over. That, I, that's great. But now start over. The cyclical process is kind of, sort of like that. Now, I was supposed to do something because I was trying to, uh, to parrot Brother McKinley a little bit because he's like the guy with the props, okay? I was supposed to bring a prop with me today, but I don't have it. Uh, any of the older folks especially, but even younger folks because, I, and I've seen some younger folks with one. Y'all remember the slinkies? Remember those? Right? So when you think about a slinky, especially when you expand it a bit, what is it? It's connected circles, right? Connected, connected, connected. They just wind up, wind up, wind up, wind up, wind up, right? That's part of the concept of what we're talking about right now. And here is why it's so important for us to understand this whole concept of spiraling upward. Have you ever, um, let's say, struggled with forgiveness with someone? And at first, the unforgiveness was really, really, really bad. And when I say really bad, what I mean by that is if that person was in somewhat close proximity of you, you might break out in hives. They literally made your skin crawl. Have you ever been there? I hope not, but probably a whole lot of folks have, right? There is at least that one person that just makes your skin crawl based on what happened, right? So let's take, take this and put it in the example we're talking about with spiraling upward. Okay, so you're reading the word of God or maybe um, like my, my wife is like the Bible app uh, plan queen. You know, we're friends on the Bible app. You know, in the morning I get ding and I look, I look. Brandy has completed day four of the so-and-so plan, right? And then bing. Brandy, Brandy has completed day six of the so-and-so. This could be in the same day. Bing! Brandy has highlighted scripture so-and-so and so-and-so. I'm like, oh my good, this is really cool, right? So let's just say that during your scripture time, your study time, maybe you're doing a plan on forgiveness, and you just really get convicted about forgiveness, right? And you say, you know what, Lord? I need to start working. Or maybe you've just heard too many let it go sermons. Amen? Too many let it go sermons. You just heard the last one. But somehow or another, you get to a point where you say, I need to change. I need to do better in this area of my life, right? And so you begin to work on it, okay? And so maybe after a little bit of time of dealing with it, praying about it, studying, meditating on it, you actually get within close proximity of that person again. Except this time you don't break out and hide. Your heart rate still gets up, though. Skin didn't do anything for you. But you can still kind of Feel it in here a little bit. Is that failure? No. That's progress. And so when we begin to look at improvement, development, and change from a cyclical standpoint, right, every now and then what you notice is that you come back around to an issue that you've dealt with before. You may not 100% be there yet, but you're not as bad as you used to be. Can I be honest with y'all? Um, 
Sometimes, sometimes. I, um, and this used to really be the case years ago. Um, you ever compare, you know, for me, you know, like my today Steve versus my old Steve, right? You ever do that with yourself in situations? And I'm, y'all do this for me. Put, put your hand like out here, don't smack yourself, but kind of out away from yourself. But I want you to pass by your face real fast, like that. You feel the wind? Okay, you feel that? There have been some times where I've been in a situation where something has come at me and the, the wind of the old Steve and the way the old Steve used to respond to something, I literally can feel the wind on my face. I can feel the wind of opportunity saying to me, Steve, man, man, now you, you know how you would normally handle that, right? Right? And y'all, I'm t- you know, you know, you know how we normally deal with this right here. You know, and I'm going, yes, but I'm not that person. I'm growing. I'm maturing. I'm believing God for better and better and better. You with me? But you can still feel it. You see that? So it's, it's, it's better, but you know that you're still going, right? You know that you're still going. Last thing I'll say about the upward spiral here is spirals emphasize the priority of quality of process over quantity of achievement. The Apostle Paul would say it this way. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. The race isn't given to the swift, but to him that endures until the end. Isn't that the word of God? Y'all, we can't just express ourselves from the bottom to the top. It takes time. It takes process. It's a quality thing not a quantity thing. See that? Let's keep going. Now, I want to, can we bring back up that Proverbs uh, 15, 24 again? Because there's something that's not visually in the scripture, but it's implied. The way of life is above to the wise. What's above? Well, let me ask you this way. Who's above? What Who or what am I spiraling up to? God. God is up there. It's God that I'm working my way to on this journey, okay? God is up there. And so I want to just say a few things about the importance of focus because as we're spiraling, as we're spiraling up, We're spiraling up with focus, and that focus is on God and the things of God, okay? Spirals emphasize the priority, and I already said that, uh, of, of process over quantity, achievement. A straight line isn't always the shortest distance between two points. It's also not always the best path between two points. So, again, that's why the spiral is good. Uh... The inward progression, and by inward progression, as we spiral up and we're focusing on God, we're not just spiraling up, we're spiraling in. So, y'all help, I don't have my prop, forgive me, okay? But I want you to think about this. Think about that slinky, right? We start at the bottom of the base, right? We're not just spiraling up, we're spiraling in. What shape are we turning the slinky into? A cone. We're not just spiraling up, we're spiraling inward. We're spiraling in to God. Guess what happens as we keep going up in that progression, right? And we're spiraling upward versus inward. Stuff is dropping off of you. Not only are you maturing, you're getting lighter. 
all of a sudden, depression is gone. All of a sudden, frustration is gone. All of a sudden, impatience is gone. All of a sudden, selfishness is gone. All of a sudden, issue after issue after issue after issue starts to fade away. Why? Because I'm getting closer to God, that he's my focus, right? And as I get closer to him, I realize something. I'm getting smaller to me, and he's getting larger to me. Think about what the Apostle Paul said. It's no longer I that live, but who? Christ. It's no longer about me, it's about him. As you keep spiraling up, and you keep spiraling in, and you're getting closer and closer, closer to your creator, the almighty, your Lord, your savior, all of a sudden, the things that used to be important to you, those aren't the things that are so important to you at all anymore. That was the, the dilemma of the young rich ruler. His stuff ultimately was his God. You see it? And his struggle was that he was kind of aware that there must be something else, but it was hard for him to actually get it. Jesus would say to the disciples later, because they said, Lord, if, if this guy who seems to have done everything right and even has the signs of doing right in terms of his wealth and all, if he can't enter into the kingdom, what hope is there for us? And Jesus said, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. The thing that that young rich ruler didn't understand is that you can't work your way in. You have to have a savior. You've got to have Christ in your life first and foremost, and he gets you to where you need to be. It's our relationship with Christ that is the essential requirement to start our cyclical path in the first place. If we don't have that first, it's a waste of time. And once we have that first, now someone else gets activated in our lives. And guess who that is? Come on, Holy Spirit. So we're not even on the journey by ourselves. We have the comforter. We have the teacher. We have the one that Jesus promised to lead and guide us into all truth with us every step of the way as we progress higher and closer to him. Now we're cooking. And now better and better and better seems a lot easier and easier. We can't do it by ourselves. But with God, all things are possible. You hear that? Before I finish... Uh, can we go back to Proverbs 15:24? Uh, we need to do something. I would be remiss if I didn't do this. Y'all, we need to talk about the other direction real fast. It says that we're spiraling upward, right? But it also says that we may depart from what? Hell. How many people now realize that all that stuff, all that selfish stuff that we were doing back in the day before Christ, that was pure hell. Anybody? Right? I'm like, Lord, thank you so much. So as we're spiraling up and going away from it, what are we going away from? How about a self-oriented nature, the flesh, just feeding it? Oh, and let me say this about the flesh, y'all, and you probably heard this before. The flesh doesn't know that you're saved nor does it care. The flesh doesn't know that you're saved, and it doesn't care that you are. The flesh only seeks what it seeks out of its nature. It knows nothing about a godly spiritual nature. So what we can't do is in some way try to train our flesh into achieving godly things. It's not possible. Then we get back to flexing, looking like a thing, but not that thing at all. And it's costly. It costs us time, right? And frustration because we get to places and we expect for God to show up and he's not there. And he's not there because he was never with us all along. That was us. 
It was us. Self-oriented value systems. Y'all, you know what happens when we don't want to do things God's way? We do it our way, and then we trick ourselves into thinking that that's fine. Look, how about this? Here we go right here. Whenever you or someone else that you're talking to, whenever you hear them use this phrase, God knows my heart. Lord, have mercy. It's never a good thing. God knows my heart. Yes, brother, sister, he does. And that's the problem, <laughs> is that he knows your heart. And he knows exactly why you're doing what you're doing. And many times, brothers and sisters, it has nothing to do with the Lord. Number three, self-deception goes right along with self-oriented value system. Stricking ourselves in the thinking that what we're doing is good when it is not really good at all. Selfish pursuits. Why? Because we can. In my experience, I don't know about yours, but in my experience, some of the most miserable people I've ever seen in my life are also the most selfish people I've, I've ever seen in my life. Have you noticed that? Selfish people tend to be fairly miserable. Why? Because everything has to go their way for life to be right. I need everybody to treat me the way I want to be treated. I need to have the kind of job that I think I should deserve to have. All life is relative to them, and that is not realistic at all, right? Jesus said, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? So even in that situation where I think I'm seemingly winning, I'm ultimately losing. See that? Last point here is we must also be mindful of the gravitational pull of the old self. Have you ever been there? The flesh doesn't know, and that's what we said before, that we were saved. It doesn't care, and it doesn't have a memory. It wakes up in the morning, that new morning, bright and fresh. I, how about this? I heard it this way from a friend of mine. He said um, back in the day he used to have a cocaine addiction. And, uh, and by the power of God, he broke that thing, never went to a program or anything. He just came to church. That's what he used to tell, tell everybody all the time. And he said to me one time, we were just talking, you know, just, just personally, and he said, Brother Steve, he said, let me tell you something. He said, um, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm done with cocaine addiction. He said, however, every day my body reminds me that I used to be addicted to cocaine. And every day I have to tell it no. Every day. You get that? We can't feed that old thing, but that old thing is still there. And so we need to be aware of that, right? Praise the Lord. So in conclusion, honestly, I understand the dilemma of the rich young ruler. I also started out as a young man wanting to pursue riches, accolades, and fame. I told you all about how I used to be even when I first got in church. And people would say, you know, at this moment, I just really want to thank. And in my mind, I would go, Steve. I was posturing myself. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, no, it's okay. Doing the Lord's work. Yeah, you know, we just were thinking about this and it's just been on our heart and our mind, you know, this person, so and so. And I'm going, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. When I was at work, when I solved a big technical problem at work, I used to walk out into the hall, kid you not. I would walk out in, in the hall and I would go, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, I don't know if you ever saw me do that at CCL, but I, I used to, early on, I used to do that at CCL. Solve a big problem and I would just walk out in the hall and just stretch out, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I had problems, y'all, but at some point, we have to wake up, grow up, and realize that without Christ, nothing will last and nothing matters. He is our source, our example, our template, our Savior, and our Lord. 
In him is salvation and eternal life with God. God is calling us to go beyond celebrating being one step over the salvation line and calling, and calling the game won and the fight over. Our initial salvation is merely the beginning of a never-ending journey in this life of pursuing all that God is and all that God has for us. The word says that we are to go from faith to faith and from glory to glory. Be willing to embrace this upward journey to him as we also focus inward to all he is and desires us to be. The best that life has in this, this best that life has in this world to offer can be found and had in the master's hand. Anyone remember, uh, oh, it was about 15, 20 years ago where the prayer of Jabez was really big? There used to be a whole bunch of books on the prayer of Jabez. I don't know if that for folks have been in church for a while. Yeah, I mean, a whole bunch of pastors wrote a whole lot of books on the prayer of Jabez. Okay? One thing I always loved about the prayer of Jabez is when he said, but Lord, as you bless me, keep me in your Keep me in your hand. All I want from you, God, is what's in your hand. Nothing outside of that matters. Nothing outside of that is important. Everything that I'll ever do, everything that I'll ever become, everything that I'll ever have ought to be in your hand because that's where I desire. Y'all, it's when we get outside of the hands of the Lord trying to achieve things that have nothing to do with his will for our life, that life begins to fall apart for us. We got to make sure that we stay in his hand. Choose life and not death, heaven and not hell, eternal joy and not eternal pain and suffering. Be willing to give yourself to an almighty God who will transform you into the very likeness of his son, for his glorious purposes, and you will never be ashamed in this life or the life to come. Y'all, it's possible for things to get better and better and better in our lives for the glory of God. But we have to be willing to change. We can't be just happy with desiring godly things. We have to be about godly purpose, godly plan, godly design, godly ways for our life. Amen? Let's all stand. We're going to go ahead and close out. Thank you for hanging in there with me. I know this one was a little long. Amen. Now you, now you see why I needed part two. Amen? I can hear the person on the organ just playing softly. I, I don't know about y'all, but I can actually hear it. I can hear it. it. Must be coming. I can, I can hear. It. I don't know about um, where you are in your life. I don't know if you would say that you find yourself closer to the rich young ruler, or that person already on that that cone cyclical path spiraling up to God. And it's okay. But what I can tell you is, God is able. He's able. And so we're going to pray, and um, I'll say this. If there's anyone that uh, you just know that change is necessary, that change is needed, that although you've been coming to church and maybe you've been reading your Bible, you've been doing some things, but you get a sense that there's something else that ought to be. I want you to come and, and let's come up to the front and kind of separate if you're coming. And uh, we're going to pray and believe God together. Um, so that's number one. That's the call. Number two is uh, it's tough sometimes in this journey. And if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes we can run out of hope. And hope is critical in this walk with the Lord. You know, that, that 1 Corinthians 13 and that last scripture, what does it say? In the end, there is faith, hope, 
and love. The greatest of them is love. But hope is one of the big three. And if there's anyone today that says, you know what, Brother Steve, I'm kind of kind of struggling a bit with my hope. It's not that I don't know that God is real. It's not that I'm not saved, that I don't believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, but I'm tired. And my hope muscle is just a bit taxed. If that's you, come up and join us as well. And finally, if you just know that you need to improve, yeah, you've been doing some things, but you're ready to take this thing to the next level and the next level and the next level and the next level. If that's you, come and join us to the front as well. Anybody? Okay, let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the way it challenges us and the way that you love us through your word. Lord, the reality is that we need you. But sometimes what we don't realize is just how much we need. I pray today, Lord God, for each and every person here today that we would be reminded of how much of a dependent we are of you. That we would be reminded of what Jesus said when he said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Lord, may our dependence on you grow and mature. That while we are on this journey, while we're spiraling upward and spiraling inward, that, Lord, we wouldn't get tired, that we wouldn't get taxed. That, Lord, we would be able to have our hope intact. And even along the way, when every now and then trouble comes, Lord, we would know and have confidence that you are with us, that you promise to never leave us nor forsake us. Lord, let us continue to boldly proclaim the good news of the gospel both to people and to ourselves. Sometimes we need to preach to us. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. Holy Spirit, we thank you for being on this journey with us each and every step of the way. May we become wiser in you. And may we become lesser in ourselves that you might become greater and increase in us. Lord, we thank you and we bless you today. May change come and may things be better and better and better for your glory. Lord, that when people see us and they see our change and they see how much better things are, they would look at us and conclude that there must be a God. Let us be prepared to witness the goodness of God as our life looks more like you. I just believe that there are a lot of people that need to see God in us. Lord, we thank you and we love you and we magnify you and bless the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, and amen.